Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is Wednesday, September 3rd, 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast, Market Pullback, More to Come. This is a question we are, of course, asking. You know, very timely here. And of course, this is just pure coincidence, pure luck that yesterday we happened to have a podcast that was titled Risk, Reward, Danger, Alert. And of course, that was a question as well. And the reason I brought that up for yesterday's discussion was because we had a strong market rally yesterday, but we also had a strong rally in the volatility index, the VIX. And I said, "Uh, that's a head scratcher. And with so many other things out of whack, one valuation after the next that is just making daily records, which is not a good thing, folks, because this isn't from organic growth. This is from a Banana Republic printing press. This is from madness and insanity. This is bubble insanity. This is bubble mania. Probably even make an argument that it's hyper bubble mania. So I wanted to ask the question, and we've been waiting for some sort of pullback for a very long time within these markets. So the question remains, is this the start of a larger leg to the downside, or is this just a market that has been overbought, overextended for a long period of time? Is this just your run-of-the-mill pullback? Let's take a breather, let's calm down, and then let's continue higher. Either scenario is quite possible. Uh, I, again, I don't say this to be wishy-washy or to hedge my bets. This audience understands my long-term vision for where these markets are headed. But that's the world in which we live. That's what could happen. I am a small fish in a very big ocean. My opinion really doesn't matter at the end of the day. There's a lot of money circulating out there. There's a lot of funny money being thrown into the system, pretty much for this purpose, to keep financial asset prices higher at any cost. So we already saw, because of this pullback today, we already saw a couple Fed officials come out and say, oh yeah, the the, the Federal Reserve is going to do more quantitative easing. We got to do more. It's perfectly okay if we do more. And the Congress has to get together and pass further stimulus. That's what they call it. Of course, this is just spending. It's not stimulative at all. All it's going to do is drive up asset prices even further, which is going to cause an even larger wedge when we're looking at income and economic inequality, which is just going to continue to cause further economic chaos and decline, further political decline, and and further social decline. The volatility index gained 26 percentage points today and is now trading at 33.60. That's the VIX. I mean, you have to remember, the VIX was up in the 80s, I believe, back in uh, March and April when we had the massive sell-off earlier this year. So, again, what's going to happen next? Could this really just have been a day of profit-taking? And and why today, right? Why, Why all of a sudden, September 3rd? of all days. Why for that to be the day where the, where this is profit taking, if that's even the case? Or did the bears come out of hibernation? Because with this massive market rally that we have been witnessing for the past several months, a lot of bears threw in the towel. This is basically everybody is on one side of the ship. And it's just bull market, bull market, bull market. So is this the bears waking up? Was this just some profit taking, run of the mill? What's going on here? A lot of questions that need to be asked and a lot of questions that need to be answered. And time is going to prove this out. But this was most definitely a significant pullback. And when you have these types of massive run-ups, you are going to see this type of volatility. And this is what I caution against every single day. Because so many people have no idea that this is basically even a possibility. So many people who are just, you know, they're, they're now becoming day traders. They've never experienced this type of thing. They, they've been convinced that stocks only go up and they can only go up. 
What kind of money do they have on the line? How many people got into Apple? How many people got into Tesla because of their stock split announcement? Okay, and we're going to talk about their share price performance today as well. But these are just some things to keep in the back of your mind and in the front of your mind because this is going to continue to unravel. The question is, when is it really going to really, when is the bottom really going to fall out on all of this? Because there's most definitely the possibility that this can go higher. This is an election year. Donald Trump is obsessed with the stock market. The Banana Republic printing press has thrown a lot of money into the Treasury, and we know that the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve are basically working hand in glove, and we know where a lot of that money is going because we can look at the stock market on a daily basis. So a lot of things are coming together here. And of course, yesterday, Thunder Thumbs tweeted out that, you know, self-congratulations to himself that the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed above 29,000. Aren't we so lucky to have him as president? And if Joe Biden was president, the markets would crash. And then, of course, the very next day, that, of course, being today, you saw a huge sell-off. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up, folks. The dollar index... Trading at 92 spot 793. Not too, too much movement with the dollar today. Still on its downtrend, but we are going to monitor this closely. Major indexes were down a few percentage points. The NASDAQ was down, I think, close to 6% at its lows during the day. Right now on overnight futures trading, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is trading flat. The S&P 500 is trading down about two-tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ 100 is also trading in the red, down about one percentage point at the time of this podcast. The cash trade in Japan, in red, down 1.3%. A sea of red across the pond in Europe. The UK markets were down 1.5%. Germany down 1.4%. France down 0.4%. Italian markets were down 1.5%, and the Spanish markets gave back 0.15% on the day. Cash trade in Australia, big down day right now, down over 3 percentage points, giving a lot of those gains back. And, of course, Australia is in a recession the first time in 30 years. Cash trade in the Chinese markets are also down 1.4 percentage points. On the share front here in the United States, Apple gave back 8% on the day alone. Tesla gave back an additional 9%. Tesla stock is trading at 407 a share. A lot of analysts, technical analysts, think the 405 and 400 threshold is a key indicator. It has been support. They think if that busts through 400, well, look out below, there could be an air pocket below. And a lot of those people who thought they were going to become five times wealthier by purchasing <coughs> Tesla after the stock split are going to learn the hard way, unfortunately. Microsoft also gave back six percentage points for the day. Amazon gave back four and a half. Alphabet, the parent company of Google, gave back five percent. And Facebook gave back 3.76 percent to round it off. On the commodity front, WTI is trading at $40.91 a barrel. Brent is at $43.61. Natural gas at $2.48. Gold and silver both gave back quite a bit today as well. However, right now, futures market, I'm sorry, the spot market is trading up for both gold and silver. Gold spot is at $1,937 an ounce. Silver spot, $26.72. Now, I imagine gold and silver are going to continue to outperform as we continue marching forward in the financial world of Oz with the printing press at full bore. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, ultimately, who ends up in the White House? There is going to be more spending. There is going to be more quantitative easing. There is going to be more emergency facilities being utilized. Make no mistake about it. There is too much heartbreaking economic, economic in, in real lives, real data waiting in the wings that affects real people, real families, real businesses. Once a lot of these moratoriums are lifted, once a lot of the programs that were established within the Nobody Cares Act, uh, once those expire as well, and, and I think... We're starting to witness some of that, and we're going to get to that when we talk about the initial claims report from the Department of Labor. 
But to round things off, Uncle Sam's 10-year U.S. Treasury junk note is yielding 0.63%. So there you have it, folks. That's some of the market performance. Now on to that Department of Labor report. For the week ending August 29th, initial claims, 881,000. This is a decrease from the prior week ending August 22nd of 130,000. So in the right direction, but does that tell the whole story? And of course, we will get to that on the continuing claims front for the week ending August 22nd. Again, this lags August 22nd, 13,254,000 is the number for continuing claims. That's a decrease of 1,238,000 from the prior week ending August 15th. Now, when we look at the pandemic unemployment assistance for the week ending August 29th, we have 759,482 individuals. This is an increase from the week prior of 151,674. When we tally it all up, when we take into consideration regular state, federal employees, newly discharged veterans, pandemic unemployment assistance, pandemic emergency UC, which would be unemployment compensation, extended benefits, state additional workers, I'm sorry, state additional benefits and work share. We have a grand total for the week ending August 15th. This also lags a couple weeks, 29,224,000 Americans. Now hold on to your hats because the week over week change for the grand total is an increase of 2 million 195,000 and then some. Grand total, 29,224,000. The prior week, which was August 8th, 27 million. Now that's huge. Now, where did most of this come from? Well, most of it came from the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, which is now at 13.5 million. The week prior, which was ending August 8th, was at 10.9, so an increase of nearly. 2.6 million Americans getting on the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, which was part of the Nobody Cares Act. Now, a lot of this, to qualify for this program, this really takes into consideration your 1099, your contract workers, your gig workers, and your self-employed. Because typically, unemployment is not offered to that cohort. But because of the Nobody Cares Act, they created a larger umbrella, and so these individuals can qualify for benefits. Now, it doesn't mean that these benefits are going to be received because we know hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Americans have still yet to receive all of their unemployment insurance. Some of them have received some, and then they've stopped receiving it, even though they still qualify. There, there's a lot of shenanigans going on. But of course, this is par for the course. States are broke. The federal government's broke. But if you're a major corporation, up, oh, don't worry about it. Drop of a hat, you're going to get billions of dollars, and the Federal Reserve's even going to purchase your corporate debt. Can't, I mean, come on. This is the grand old U.S. of A. This is how it works, baby. Get with it. So this is going to get really interesting because we know from various surveys, of course, assuming these are true, that a lot of the funds from the PPP loans were expected to become exhausted throughout August, and particularly early August. And this data for the grand total, it lags a couple weeks. So this is August 15th, the week ending. So when you see this huge run-up in the pandemic unemployment assistance, well, here's your gig workers, here's your small businesses, your self-employed people. Okay, I got the loans. I did what I had to do. I hired people. I didn't lay them off so I can turn that loan into a grant. But now there's no demand. Now I'm closing up shop. Now I might very well qualify for this. I need it because I'm out of business, what have you. I don't know if that's what's going on. There's so many distortions like I have been stating here for months. We are not going to have a full picture until all of these moratoriums and all of these various Nobody Cares Act programs come to an end. And of course, the administration is doing its damnedest through executive orders and the power of the pen to extend as much of this as possible. Because as we discussed earlier this week, the White House 
is extending a national eviction moratorium. And there are constitutional questions about whether they have the authority to do that, even with that law that exists that can give the CDC, because that's where it's through, the CDC the authority to implement such a moratorium. Because those that govern evictions are at the state level. So there are going to be some constitutional questions raised, and I would not be surprised if you start to see in some of the news lawsuits uh, going against the federal government, especially if landlords are not protected by this because they're still holding paper, they're still holding the mortgage for these properties. And if they're not given some sort of assistance or a bailout or a moratorium, well, then how are they going to continue to pay their mortgage on those properties? How are they going to do it? You're going to say, well, my tenants aren't paying. They don't have to pay by, quote unquote, the law. So I can't go after them. But I can't pay my mortgage on this property. And nobody's helping me out. So what do we do? What am I supposed to do? Well, they're going to sue. Because what, else, what, what, what other recourse do they have to at least see if they can possibly do it? So I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying be on the lookout for it. Because another thing that we are seeing when it comes to lawsuits is because the way that New York City, that idiot Mayor de Blasio, is handling the quote-unquote reopening of New York and not allowing restaurants to open for indoor dining. Well, now you have a whole bunch of restaurants suing New York City and I also believe the state of New York for these asinine policies for billions of dollars. And of course, people are leaving New York en masse and they're broke too. So where's the money going to come from? Where are they going to get it? If, of course, is assuming the restaurant block wins the day in court for all of those damages that they are seeking. This is the mess, folks. This is the mess that is really just starting to unravel. I told you this was going to happen months ago. I told you this is what happens when the government gets involved with everything. This is the system coming to an end. And you know what you have to say? You have to thank God. You have to thank God. As nasty as this is going to be and as painful as it's going to be for millions of people in this country and for billions of people around the world, this unfortunately is what needed to happen. And I take no pleasure in saying this, believe me, when I tell you. But I have been shouting from the rooftops here on this podcast, wrote about it in our book, The Cynic's Guide to Investing, trying to do what can be done to educate and inform as many people that this system is completely unsustainable, that it's immoral, that it's unethical, that it's un-American. We should not want to defend this system that is in existence and it is in your face how it operates, who it's working for, who it benefits. Every single day in your face. Neither demented joker, demented idiot at the top of either of these political party tickets is talking about it. None of them talk about the structural issues. Donald Trump goes out there and pats himself on the back, congratulates himself for a Dow 29,000. Seriously? Millions of people facing eviction, homelessness, can't feed their kids, losing their jobs. Hey, the Dow's up 29,000, you know, not, you know, uh, 90% of financial assets are owned by 10% of, uh, of the population. But yeah, you know, pat me on the back, I'm the best. This guy's got to go. Again, I'm not voting for either of them. I just don't know how anybody can support either of them. I can understand you don't like the other guy and you think you're picking a lesser of two evils, but I don't know how you can be for either of these people. I really don't. But that's just me. But that's where we are. The system is coming to, a, to an end. These jokers know it. The Federal Reserve knows it. Central banks the world over know it. But they're just not going to admit it. Because they're the puppet masters. These are the men and women behind the curtain. And even though their actions are in your face, it's all being revealed to you, people would rather pay attention to other things. But that's par for the course, and that's why we have the issues that we do. So unfortunately... The grand total number of Americans collecting some form of unemployment insurance is at 29.2 million, an increase of 2.2 million from the prior week of August 8th. 
And then tomorrow we are going to get the jobs report for the month of August. And who knows what type of manipulation we're going to see in this thing. I, I mean, who knows? Who knows? But it's interesting to note that for the month of August, just keep this number in mind, for the month of August, when you add up all of the initial jobless claims, it comes out to 5,158,000. All initial jobless claims for the month of August, 5,158,000. So keep that number in mind as we go through tomorrow's jobs report. On to the Federal Reserve's BS, and of course I mean the balance sheet. 7 trillion, 17 billion. This is an increase over the prior week. Uh, about $27 billion, because we were at 6.99 trillion last week. So 7 trillion, 17 billion. And of course, as I stated at the top of the podcast, the Federal Reserve is waiting in the wings to print more money and is just begging Congress to do more spending. Because that's how it works. Congress doesn't have the money, so the Federal Reserve is going to have to print it. And at the clip, the, the way that the Federal Reserve is purchasing U.S. Treasuries across the yield curve and mortgage-backed securities, I mean, they are getting at the point, the Federal Reserve is, when it comes to mortgage-backed securities. They are almost the entire market. And as we asked the other day, what's the end game? Is that the end game? Is the end game for the Federal Reserve to basically own everything? Is that the end game for them to be in complete control? And for all of it to be backstopped by the U.S. government, meaning you and me, the taxpayer? Is that the end game? I'd like to know if there are any uh, financial journalists who have the cojones to ask Chairman Powell that question. I know there aren't any idiots in Congress who are going to ask that question. But that would be... An interesting one to see how the chairman of the Federal Reserve would skirt around that question because they're buying everything. They got they got emergency facilities that basically give them the authority to buy whatever they want with the exception of stocks outright, but that's just a wink, wink, nod, nod joke. I mean, that that's all that is. Pay no attention type of thing. But de facto, that's what they're doing. That's where it's going. They're just creating a middleman to do it for them. But as the president told us, so long as he's president, this will never be a socialist nation. Ah, too late, Mr. President, but nice try. Nice try. What else do we have? Money stock, M2. Money stock is at $18,386,000,000. This is actually a little bit of a rollover from the prior week, and this lags. So this data is up to date for August 24th. But nonetheless, still at basically an all-time high. Eighteen trillion three hundred and eighty-six billion dollars. That's inflation, ladies and gentlemen. If they keep it up, which they're going to, uh, you know, just just believe me when I tell you, hyperinflation is going to be experienced. Uh, it, most definitely in other countries around the world, it's already being witnessed. Again, in Lebanon, in Venezuela, Iran is not too far behind. The Turkish lira, they're they're experiencing significant inflation, and of course. Turkey is arguing with Greece and Cyprus and even France about some territorial claims in the Mediterranean Sea because they are finding some large deposits of oil and gas. I believe I mentioned this prior. So there, there are a lot of geopolitical tensions that are still going on around the world, and they are not going to go away anytime soon. So that's something to be mindful of as well. So it doesn't take much, folks. Once you start these dominoes, once they start falling, the momentum will pick up and feed on itself. And the dominoes have been set up for a very long time. They've been set up before COVID-19. The protests, the riots were here before COVID-19. They were on pause for a little while. They're back in full force, and they are only going to get worse, especially if hyperinflation does get exported around the world, which I imagine it will before it comes home to roost here in the United States, because that's pretty much also part of the end game is the obliteration of the dollar. And there are some other uh, reports circulating out there that China is going to continue to reduce their U.S. Treasury holdings. About a trillion right now, about a trillion dollars worth of U.S. Treasuries are on the books over in China 
but they're trying to get that number around to around 800 billion. That's significant. That, that's a decrease of 20%, and I wouldn't be surprised if they're really trying to get it lower. So what do you think they know? Hmm? What do you think they're thinking? Probably very similar to what I talk about here on a daily basis, that this is funny money, and they don't want to get paid back with inflated and hyperinflated funny money. Okay, And that's the Chinese. All right, that, talk about a con job. I mean, this, this, is, this is like magicians pulling goofs on each other. This is, this is like one Ponzi scheme. So, oh, no, I know you're running a Ponzi scheme, and I know you're running a Ponzi scheme because I'm running a Ponzi scheme, and I'm getting the hell out of Dodge because you're going to screw me before I screw you type of thing. That's all this is. This is a big joke. That's what's going on here. And to think, to, to be... I don't want to come off as insulting. I just don't know how else to put it. To be somewhat small-minded when it comes to our presidential elections with these two idiots. To think that they're even discussing these issues that's at, that's at large here. That's coming down the pike. It's staring us right in the face, but nobody wants to admit it. I, I Again, I just don't know how either of these candidates can be taken seriously. I mean, you put, you know, you put some, some images on the news... And you have your commentators talk about it, and people are going to go into their respective silos to hear their tilt on it, and that's it. That's it. You got some streets burning down, some buildings, blah, blah, blah. That's it. That's all it comes down to. Those are the main issues. They want you paying attention to those things. They want you paying attention to the chaos in the streets, but they don't want you asking the questions, well, why is there chaos in the streets? Why are people up in arms? Why are people so upset with what's going on? Because they know... They might not be able to put their finger on it, but they know that something isn't right. And something isn't right. The system is collapsing. The system is collapsing, and it's going to be devastating. But as I stated earlier, that's what needs to happen. The question is, what gets adopted on the other side? And I'm quite, frankly, quite concerned because chances are it's not going to be the restoration of our constitution and it's not going to be the restoration of free market capitalism this is going to be the forward march if you would really backward but this is going to be the march towards more totalitarianism this is going to be i mean it doesn't matter whatever word you want to use communism fascism socialism it, do, it doesn't make any difference because the destination is the same it's just a question of how it's structured is it total government control or is it a partnership between government and major corporations, which we have now. Some twisted blend of them, which is also what we have in this country, too. Those are the questions. I hope and pray it's the restoration of our Constitution, equal justice under the law, and I hope and pray that it is a restoration of free market capitalism. But I'm quite concerned that it's not going to be. And so as destructive as the decline of this system is going to be. What waits on the other side, if we don't adopt the right policies and the right systems, is going to be even worse. So write your congressmen, write your senators, ask questions, and turn as many of your friends and family on to the Capitol News as possible, because this message has to get out there, and I hope it resonates with people. Because this isn't just news, this is an education. That's really what this podcast is all about. I just try to use the news as real-world, real-time examples. So stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capitol News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.